Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. Welcome back to Biochemistry on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, I want to talk about three things that have to do with drug metabolism, and those are the first pass effect, sometimes called first pass metabolism, and then phase one metabolism and phase two metabolism. But before we get into that, we need to have a basic understanding of how most of these drugs ultimately get distributed through the body. And for the purpose of this video, we're going to consider a drug that's taken orally. So if the drug is taken orally, that means by mouth. And so when the person swallows that drug, it's going to go through the esophagus and the stomach and so on and so forth. And it's going to ultimately end up going through the GI tract. And so if we look down here at the bottom of the screen, we have the small intestines and then the large intestines, ultimately terminating with the rectum and anus. And depending on which region of the GI tract we're talking about, a different set of veins drains that region. So if we look at the small intestine and also the ascending part of the large intestine, or ascending colon, and the transverse colon, those components of the GI tract are drained by branches of the superior mesenteric vein. So for example, if you have a drug that when it gets through the GI tract is ultimately absorbed in any part of the small intestine or the ascending or transverse colon, it's actually picked up by the superior mesenteric vein. You can see a bunch of branches here that are going to each of those regions. And so that drug is then gonna be absorbed into the superior mesenteric vein. And if we follow that vein back, it ultimately dumps into the hepatic portal vein. We'll come back to that in just a minute. Now, the vast majority of drugs taken orally are gonna be absorbed from the GI via the superior mesenteric vein. There are a few that may actually be absorbed via the inferior mesenteric vein. If we look at this vein, we can see that its branches are gonna drain the descending colon, sigmoid colon, and then not shown here, there's also some parts of the rectum that'll be drained via the inferior mesenteric vein. And so we can follow that vein back. We see that it does not dump directly into the hepatic portal vein. Instead, it actually merges with the splenic vein. And so the splenic vein is gonna drain contents of the spleen. Uh, for example, some toxins that may accumulate there because the spleen is a secondary lymphatic organ. And then also particular degradation products of red blood cells and platelets and so on. But regardless of which region of the GI tract the drug is absorbed from, you can see that all of these roots are going to lead to the hepatic portal vein and then ultimately to the liver. So what we can see so far is that when a drug is taken orally, it goes all throughout the digestive tract. It's absorbed by a specific vein, which then dumps into the hepatic portal vein and then goes to the liver. That's very important. So before this drug ever makes it to a target cell or target tissue, it first has to go through the liver. The liver is sort of like a checkpoint when you're bringing imports from one country into another country. And so that liver is that checkpoint. So again, as we saw, after absorption from the GI into the blood, the drugs travel via this hepatic portal vein to the liver and they're gonna enter into these sinusoids. These are vessels within the liver that have very large spaces in their walls. They allow things to leak out and some things to leak in. So a drug that's coming up here through the hepatic portal vein, when it enters the sinusoids, it can actually leak out and be taken up by certain cells of the liver. These cells are called hepatocytes. And within the hepatocytes, that drug is gonna be metabolized to some extent. Now this is all probability, but some of these drugs, when they come into the liver here, they're gonna be able to avoid being taken up by these hepatocytes and they'll go through here into the general circulation unmodified. But some of them will be taken up by hepatocytes and be metabolized normally into an inactive or partially inactive form. So to understand that, let's look at an active drug right here. So the active drug is gonna be this green color. We've got a certain number of those. Now, within the liver, some of these are going to be taken up by the hepatocytes. And there's going to be enzymes within those hepatocytes that are going to chemically modify the drug, normally inactivating it to some extent. And those ones that have been modified are going to be this red color right here. 
But as you can see, not all of them were taken up by hepatocytes. These green ones, these ones that are still green, avoided that. But the red ones have now been modified. Now just a side note right here. This conversion of an active drug to an inactive drug by the liver, this is a typical case. It's not always this way. It gets complicated very quickly. Sometimes you can actually intake an inactive drug and these enzymes can actually activate the drug. Again, it gets complicated, so let's just assume this simple case right here. So back to this. What we've seen is we've taken a drug orally, it's gone through the GI tract, it's been absorbed into the blood, ultimately to this hepatic portal vein, and now it's made it to the liver, the very first checkpoint. And what we saw is that some of the drugs, this green one, is unmodified, unchanged, it makes it through but then some of it is actually metabolized into an inactive form. And at this point in time, at this checkpoint right here at the liver, these drugs have not seen the general circulation. They have not been given a chance to make it to their specific target tissues where they can exert their effect. But what we just saw is that some of them have been metabolized to an inactive form. These green ones have not but some percentage of these drugs have been inactivated before they ever get a chance to see the general circulation. And this is described by a very general term called the first pass effect, sometimes called first pass metabolism. And this describes these drugs before they ever reach the general circulation. When they reach the liver the very first time, some percentage of them are inactivated. So for example here, We've got nine of these drugs, five of them have been inactivated, so we could probably say 55% of them are now inactive, and only 45% of what we originally took has the potential to exert an effect. And this is what we call first pass metabolism, because this metabolism is inactivating these drugs on their first pass through the liver. So all of that is taking place in the liver right here. Now let's consider those drugs that were not modified. So they're still active. They still have the potential to be able to exert their effects. Well, they're going to have to leave the liver and they're going to do so through the hepatic veins. And ultimately they're going to end up in this very large blood vessel right here called the inferior vena cava. And of course the inferior vena cava is going to take those drugs back to the heart. Okay. Um, you can see the inferior vena cava right here. That's taking blood into the right atrium and you can follow the blood throughout the heart chambers and so on and so forth, but eventually that blood, along with the drugs, are gonna be in the left ventricle. And from the left ventricle, that blood's gonna be pumped out the aorta, and that's gonna to lead to the systemic circulation. And along with it comes the drug, still in its active form, which will then be able to go to those target tissues. But remembering what we just talked about, about 55% this drug has been inactivated. So the percentage that's actually gonna be able to exert its effects on these target tissues is only about 45% in this case, okay? So again, this first pass effect is a very general term just describing that some percentage of this drug is gonna be metabolized before it ever reaches the general circulation. This metabolism in the liver is carried out by enzymes. So enzymes contained within these hepatocytes. And the metabolism is divided up into two phases. Okay? There's phase one metabolism and there's phase two metabolism. These phases ultimately just describe different ways that the drug is chemically modified to prepare it for complete inactivation and removal from the body. So let's actually look at phase one and phase two metabolism in more detail. And to do this, we're gonna use this hypothetical drug right here. This is really ethyl benzene. It's not an actual drug, but it's gonna allow us to prove the point with a small molecule that's easy to follow. So phase one metabolism in general involves the introduction of polar groups, normally hydroxyl groups or OH groups, onto this chemical. And the purpose of adding these OH groups is that eventually we're gonna be able to attach other things to these OH groups, okay? That'll be phase two metabolism, but all phase one metabolism is, is just attaching polar groups to this molecule, okay? 
And this is generally carried out by enzymes referred to as cytochrome P450 enzymes. I'm just abbreviating it here as P450. This is a broad class or family of enzymes, and they all have different specificities for molecules. But in general, they're going to take these molecules and add OH groups. Now, as you can see here, this first reaction, an OH group is simply added directly onto this carbon right here. So now we have an OH group. And that's phase one metabolism. That's pretty much all it is. It's just introducing polar groups onto these drugs. Another reaction that P450s often do on aromatic rings like this is they epoxidate it. So rather than simply hydroxylating it, as you see up here, it'll introduce an epoxide functional group. And then there's a, a follow-up or subsequent enzyme that has to act called an epoxide hydrolase. And what this enzyme does is it busts up this epoxide into two separate hydroxyl groups. Again, phase one metabolism is just adding these polar groups that can then be conjugated in phase two metabolism. So these OH groups, yes, they're polar, but they are actually reactive so that we can add things onto them. Let's look at that. Here's phase two metabolism. So we have our base molecule right here. Okay, we've hydroxylated this ethyl benzene, and now we're gonna take this OH group and we're gonna add things onto it. So phase two metabolism, conjugation of other polar moieties to that hydroxyl group, which was added in phase one metabolism. So there's a variety of reactions that can occur. Uh, for example, a sulfotransferase reaction. This just transfers a sulfate onto that oxygen. Then we have this glucuronosyl transferase. It attaches a carbohydrate moiety, also polar, onto this oxygen. Now, there's a couple other reactions we can do here that don't really change the polarity all that much, but they are used often to inactivate drugs. Those are the acetyltransferase and methyltransferase enzymes. The acetyltransferase, again, transfers an acetyl group onto that oxygen. A methyltransferase can transfer a methyl group onto that oxygen. There's several other things we can do. A uh, reaction up here is glutathione S-transferase. Glutathione is typically abbreviated GSH. Now you can see here that the glutathione is not attached to the oxygen. Um, sometimes you can attach this directly onto the benzene ring. Okay? Uh, but again, glutathione is a very large polar group. It increases the polarity of this molecule. Going down, some other things we can do, we can actually oxidize this alcohol into an aldehyde. That's done through a specific aldehyl dehydrogenase. Then the aldehyde can be oxidized into a carboxylic acid. That's done through the aldehyde dehydrogenase. And then we can take this carboxylic acid and conjugate it to an amino acid like glycine. This is a two-step reaction. We first use an acyl-CoA synthetase to activate the carboxyl. And then another enzyme called acyl-CoA glycine and acyl transferase is gonna allow us to conjugate a glycine to this carboxyl group right here. And so what you see over here is this oxidized drug is now conjugated to glycine on the right side of the molecule right here. So why would we go to all this trouble to make these drugs more polar? Well, one, chemically modifying them inactivates them. And number two, the goal eventually is to eliminate them from the body. We can't just have them building up, so we have to eliminate them. And the two major routes of elimination are gonna be feces and urine. And if you think about urine for a second, urine is water-based. So if we want something to dissolve in urine so that we can eliminate it in the toilet, it's gonna to have to be polar. Something that's very hydrophobic, like most drugs are, is not gonna be soluble in the filtrate of the kidneys to make urine. So if we want to excrete it through the kidneys via urine, we have to make the molecule more polar. So here's a 30,000 foot view of what we're looking at here. So over here on the left side, this is what we talked about at the start of the video. We orally take the drug, it gets absorbed from the GI, and it ultimately is going to go to the liver. And you can see here that some metabolism is going to occur there in the liver. That's the first pass effect. And so any drug here that's not modified and still active then can make its way into the general circulation where it will then potentially act on the target cell. But eventually, because the circulatory system is a cycle, it'll eventually make its way back to the liver. And the liver will metabolize more of it. That is the second pass effect. And again, some of it may not be fully metabolized. So it'll go around the general circulation again and make its way back to the liver a third time. That would be the third pass effect. 
and so on and so forth. And eventually the liver will be able to get rid of all the... Now let's think about the drugs here that have been metabolized by the liver via phase one and phase two metabolism. They really have one of two fates that they're gonna undergo. In the first fate, uh, once they've been metabolized, they're going to directly enter this enterohepatic circulation. So they're going to move to the biliary system right here. You can see the gallbladder underneath the liver. And from there, they're going to enter this enterohepatic circulation, which is going to take those metabolized inactivated drugs to the GI. And they will simply be eliminated through feces. Uh, you can see here that some of them may actually enter the enterohepatic circulation uh, right after that first pass effect before they ever even get to the general circulation. Others, once they're subject to the second pass, then they'll enter enterohepatic circulation. Okay? So that's the first fate. The enterohepatic circulation takes them to the GI. They're eliminated through feces. But some of those drugs that are metabolized by the liver, they don't enter the enterohepatic circulation. They may actually continue through the general circulation. Now remember, what's the job of the kidneys? The kidneys filter the blood. And so they can actually take up some of these drugs, which can then be filtered, and they can enter the filtrate and eventually be present in the urine. And hopefully, the fact that we're eliminating some of this in the urine explains why we have the phase one and phase two metabolism. Again, yes, these chemical modifications can inactivate the drug but they serve to increase the polarity of the drug. As it stands, this ethyl benzene right here, which is not actually a drug, but it's very hydrophobic. There's no way this is gonna be soluble in blood or let alone the urine. So we're gonna to have to make it more polar. So phase one metabolism, introduce those polar groups. And then in phase two, we're gonna conjugate that polar group to something that's even more polar. And that's gonna allow it to be more easily filtered by the kidneys and then end up in the urine. So hopefully this video gave you a good overview of how these drugs are metabolized and how they're cleared by the body. And hopefully you better understand the meaning of phase one and phase two metabolism and then also the first pass effect. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.